I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here at the Roosevelt Institute to discuss new rules for the 21st century economy. I'm Mike Konzel, Director of the Macroeconom Macroeconomic Analysis Team here at the Roosevelt Institute. Drawing on the legacy of Franklin and Eleanor, the Roosevelt Institute champions new ideas and new leaders to make our economy and democracy work for the many, not the few. We're here today to discuss the economic worldview and ideas that have shaped both the Biden administration and this recovery as well as the work that remains to lay the foundation for a more inclusive, resilient economy. I'm very glad to be joined by Felicia Wong, the President and CEO of the Roosevelt Institute, Bharat Ramamorty, Deputy Director at the National Economic Council, and Ben Harris, Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at Treasury. There's a lot to cover, so I wanna get started right away. So let's just jump in with a question for each of you to answer. What are you seeing with the recovery and what has been the most notable feature of it? And I'd like to start with Felicia. Thanks so much, Mike, uh, and good morning, everybody. Um, the recovery. I think of three things, really, uh, that were remarkable about what this administration and the federal government generally has done over the last few years with respect to the economy. The first is scale. I think it's important to remember that the administration's fiscal response was at the scale of this global pandemic's challenge. Two years ago, the risk of another lost decade, which many of us remember, of course, from the Great Recession, but the risk of another lost decade was real. And the robust fiscal governmental response that we saw prevented permanent and sustained job loss and the scarring, the hysteresis that comes with it. So that's the first thing. Second thing I'd say that is really remarkable was the holistic nature of the way this administration in particular took a bird's eye view of the economy. You know, uh, this administration has really thought through what it's going to take to improve supply chains across our economy. And this administration addressed problems in ways that both that markets and firms on their own really wouldn't. This was not a privatized recovery. And then the third thing I'd say um, is a focus on equity. And I think this was especially important rhetorically because especially um, in the early days of this administration, the White House and the agencies affirmatively centered racial equity as a material goal. We've done a lot of work on this at Roosevelt and this focus on race equity is important as a moral matter and of course as an economic matter given the historic labor market and capital market exclusions. Housing redlining is the most obvious but there are so many. But these, these historic exclusions, this White House recognized that those exclusions continue to drive worse at income, worse wealth and worse health outcomes for black and brown Americans. Um, have we done perfectly on, on that in particular? No, but I think it is important to note that scale, a bird's eye view and a focus on equity were characteristic of the way this administration began to tackle the challenges of the pandemic economy. And I also know that today it's really hard to get that message out there as a narrative matter, given all the concerns, given inflation concerns, which I know we're going to talk about both substantively and politically today. But I just want all of us to remember this, that in April 2020, we were deeply concerned about 20% unemployment. And the fact that we didn't see this is due to the really aggressive actions that the federal government took. Um, and that will set the table, I think, for what we need to do with respect to steady growth and strong growth, I certainly hope so, uh, going forward. Thank you, Felicia. And now I'd like to kick the question to um, Brat. Um, what has been the, you know, what are you seeing with the recovery so far and what has been the most notable features of it? Uh, thanks, Mike, and thank you all for, for having us today. Uh, you know, to, to build on what Felicia said, I think, number one, it's important to take a step back and realize just how uh, robust and equitable this recovery has been, especially in comparison to um, the last 50 years or so uh, of, of economic history in this country. I think by many measures, this has been the most rapid and equitable uh, recovery from a recession that we've ever had. Um, and it's a testament to the robust uh, fiscal response. Uh, that the government um, has has led, uh, you know. I think we uh, just to give you a few data points on that. Number one, um, 
you know, obviously we're at 3.6 percent unemployment, uh, which is historically low. You know, last year was the single greatest year for job growth in the history of this country. Um, it was also the single greatest year for new small business formation uh, in the history of this country. Uh, we've seen uh, wages go up across the income spectrum, but particularly for those uh, at the lower end of the spectrum, which is uh, good to see and long, long overdue. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of other uh, less, uh, less widely covered, but really important stuff that happened during the recovery that, make, that sets it apart from previous recoveries. So in the past, for example, you would see that when unemployment goes up, uh, foreclosures and evictions tend to go up hand in hand. And those can be devastating for, uh, for families, both uh, economically and socially. Uh, instead, because of the foreclosure moratorium, the, the direct relief for renters, for homeowners that this administration provided, those numbers went down over the course of uh, 2021. Uh, and even as the foreclosure moratorium and eviction moratorium lifted, uh, we have not seen a wave of uh, foreclosures and evictions. Instead, we've continued to see uh, very low rates uh, for both. So there's a lot of good news. Uh, you know, of course, we are facing uh, what are a set of global challenges, most notably inflation. And uh, I did did some tweets on this the other day just because I kept seeing news stories about um, about hitting record high inflation in various countries. So I pulled them together. Yeah, you know, the UK, the Eurozone, Canada, India, and others are all facing 20, 30, 40 year high uh, inflation. Um, and that's because inflation by and large has been driven by two things. Number one, uh, the emergence of the economy from uh, from the pandemic and the shutdowns that that uh, caused. And number two, Putin's actions uh, in Ukraine, which are uh, driving up the cost of energy in particular across the globe, but also affecting other commodity prices, food, minerals, and so on. Uh, every country in the world is dealing with record high inflation by and large. Uh, what's different is that the United States is attacking that problem from a position of strength. Uh, we are in much better position than the United Kingdom, than the Eurozone and other countries. If you look at, the, at our household balance sheets, if you look at the state of our labor market, if you look at business investment and consumer spending. And so uh, I, I don't want to diminish the challenges that we are facing, but I think it's very important to note that uh, were it not for the robust recovery uh, that this uh, administration helped uh, lead, uh, we would be tackling these challenges from a weaker position. As I like to say, the counterfactual here is not that uh, the government, uh, that, we, that we did not pass the American Rescue Plan, and we are sitting here today with 2% inflation and 4.5% unemployment. I think that the counterfactual is that uh, we would be sitting here with still record high inflation and much higher unemployment and be in a much worse position to tackle these challenges than we are. Thank you, Brad. And now to Ben, um, what are you seeing with this recovery and what has been some of the most notable features to you? Thanks, Mike. Uh, Brad covered so much, uh, but let me just add a few points. You know, one of the unfortunate things about the macro economy is you can't observe the counterfactual. And, um, and it's, I think it's easy to forget where we were when President Biden took office. Uh, 20 million Americans, 20 million Americans were on unemployment. I remember during the campaign with the economic advisors having calls with the president and saying, you know, sir, you, you might be taking office in the middle of a macroeconomic environment which mirrors the, the Great Depression, not the Great Recession, the Great Depression, meaning not only can we have an extremely deep recession, but a prolonged one that could last years and could define your term. Um, Secretary Yellen laid out this risk in a recent speech to the Brookings Institution when she said, look, this was an incredibly uncertain time. Vaccines had not been disseminated yet. We hadn't seen the Delta variant yet. We hadn't seen the Omicron variant yet. And we hadn't seen a land war in Europe that would disrupt energy markets kick off yet. Um, so there was this incredibly uncertain time with the tail risk, according to Secretary Yellen, that also included the Great Recession. So. You know, as Barat said, we can't observe the counterfactual, but the counterfactual is really ugly. You know, here we are today, we've got three and a half percent unemployment. We've got a labor market, which is not only defined by plenty of jobs, but is defined by worker empowerment. We're seeing really high quits rates. So many workers are upgrading from, uh, from their jobs to higher wages, higher, higher paying jobs to jobs, which they're frankly happier in. Um, 
that are better suited for, for, their, for their lifestyle and for their families. We're seeing household balance sheets, which are in great shape. We're seeing corporate balance sheets, which are in great shape. You know, we obviously have problems with inflation, but I think it's important at events like this to take a step back and, and remember uh, some of the crises in macroeconomic terms that were avoided. The second thing I'll just mention uh, briefly is that the United States is really faring quite well relative to other advanced economies. Um, obviously, we're dealing with inflation, but inflation is not uni uniquely American. We see similar inflation rates uh, across the Atlantic and in other countries. Uh, U.S. growth, particularly if you use, and I'm getting very wonky here for a second, but you use gross domestic income rather than gross domestic product, which is not cherry picking. There are reasons to believe that's a superior metric. Uh, our economy would have expanded over 2% last quarter and has uh, superseded our, our pre-pandemic growth rates. Um, on the labor market recovery, uh, you know, some of this is due to labor market institutions, why we saw a steeper decline in the U.S. relative to Europe and other advanced economies, but the rebound in the U.S. has been spectacular uh, relative to others. So not only have we avoided this incredibly deep recession that, that could have included scarring, as Felicia noted, but we're doing pretty darn well compared to our competitors. And so, um, you know, I think it's important at events like this to just take stock of, of really how far we've come. Thanks. I will plus one the wonky uh, GDI point, even if you average them, which I think is also a very good metric. It's a very important uh, thing. It's notable last year, the challenge was that um, BLS was reporting about 100,000 fewer jobs than were actually being created in real time. And you had to wait to see it actually be created in retrospect. Right now, BA is probably missing about a trillion dollars in economic output. I don't know if you can say that, but I can say that. And uh, it's probably because of some weird inputs in, in the way it's uh, measuring things, but it's a far more robust recovery with major implications for deficits and investments than I think we would have seen otherwise. But I will stop walking about that and talk about something that's very relevant for everyday people. Um, let's bear down on the labor market for a second. Um, what are you seeing there? What are you attributing to? I'm going to open it up to everyone. And most importantly, I think, um, what can we do to make some of the positive sides people brought up? Um, small business formation, the great, uh, you know, the great upgrade with people switching jobs after decades of stagnation and labor market dynamism and very low quit rates. We're seeing people find better jobs. What can be done to make sure that these positive signs for worker powers and the economy more broadly are durable and sustained? So I'm happy to go first on this one, if that's okay, uh, Felicia. So, um, you know, strong demand can do wonders for the labor market. And I think we're seeing that now with a, a level of worker empowerment that I'm not sure I would, I would ever see in my career. Uh, and obviously very, very happy to see an economy which works for uh, American workers. And as Brought noted, not only is it strong in macroeconomic terms, but this is also equitable. So uh, the black unemployment rate had the largest calendar year drop since 1983 and is now below its pre-pandemic rate. Uh, the Hispanic unemployment rate saw a record calendar year drop last year and is also below its pre-pandemic rate. So it's, it's not just robust, but it's also equitable. But Mike, you asked what can be done. And other, for, other, other than maintaining a strong macroeconomic recovery, one thing we've been looking at at Treasury has been competition. And if I wanted to sort of characterize uh, the Biden administration um, view on economic policy, there's obviously a lot of characteristics, but one is I think that we're hopelessly devoted to competition, whether it's in the product market or in the labor market. There's been a real evolution in thinking among economists on labor market competition. I mean, even in the Biden administration, when I was working for now President uh, Biden, when he was vice president, we spent a lot of time thinking about labor market competition. We spent a lot of time thinking about non-compete agreements, mandatory arbitration, uh, lack of wage transparency. And we were met with a lot of pushback by some really good economists who would sort of point to the textbook case. Um, you know, fast forward to the AEAs this year when Nobel laureate David Card gave a speech called Who Sets Your Wage? And basically acknowledged widespread lack of competition in the labor market. I mean, this has been a, just a dramatic shift in thinking among many economists. And instead of arguing over whether or not there is lack of competition, we're now fortunate to argue what we're gonna do about it. And the Treasury Department wrote, put out this sort of sweeping 30 page report with the help of DOL and others. Um, but one thing we can do to make this enduring, Mike, to your comment is we can 
ensure that these are these are more competitive labor markets that workers have the ability to switch to better paying jobs that they know about those better paying jobs in the first place that it's not illegal for them to do so now some of the frictions in the labor market are natural and so it's not it's not as though i'm just wagging my finger at employers um but there are labor policies which can better enable workers to take advantage of opportunities and um, you know, I think as an administration, we're 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 focused on that, and that that can be one of our legacies. Um, happy to jump in for just a couple uh, quick points to add to Ben's. You know, number one, um, the, the president issued an executive order on competition uh, a little bit uh, under a year ago, and one of the things that he encouraged the Federal Trade Commission to do was to uh, issue a rule. Uh, banning or, or severely limiting uh, non-compete agreements. And so uh, obviously the FTC is an independent agency and we don't dictate what they do uh, or don't do or on what timeline, but uh, we're hopeful that such a rule uh, will emerge from the FTC in the not so distant future, which would be uh, transformative given that one out of five workers in the United States is subject to, to, to one of those agreements. Now, two other quick points um, about the labor market. Number one, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, labor force participation, right, which is essentially the, the percentage of workers that are either employed or, or actively looking for work. Um, what you see typically after a recession is that uh, it takes a while for those uh, participation rates to recover. Um, we have seen a relatively rapid uh, recovery uh, among labor for labor force participation such that uh, among prime age workers, so those between the ages of 25 and 54, uh, the level of participation is back to what it was uh, what it was before the pandemic, uh, and uh, and we've seen a lot of encouraging uh, in increase in labor force participation among uh, what, what were termed the early retirees before people between the ages of fifty five and sixty five. A lot of whom left uh, left the workforce uh, at the beginning of the pandemic uh, and were resistant to coming back for a little while, uh, but now are being attracted back into the workforce in large part because. Uh, it's safer to return to work and also because the wages and, and benefits and job opportunities that are being offered are uh, much more appealing to them. So uh, we're, we're seeing good signs uh, on labor force participation. Uh, increasing labor force participation not only means that more people get to take advantage of a historically strong labor market, it's also um, an important way of uh, increasing the productive capacity of our economy. More people working means more, more people producing more stuff, uh, and that's good. Um, you know, the second point uh, I, I would make is that, um, you know, how do we build on where we are right now? We we should encourage uh, unionization. The president has been entirely uh, clear about this. Uh, he likes to say that he's the most pro-labor president in history, and, and I have no good reason to doubt him uh, on that. Um, but uh, but we're, we're already seeing uh, new unionization at, at a, vi a variety of, of, new, of employers. Uh, the, the data on this is pretty clear. Uh, being part of the union means that you get access to better wages, uh, better benefits, uh, more protections during uh, economic downturns, better working conditions. Um, and so our hope uh, is that, um, that we can make a concerted effort both with new legislation and through other means to, uh, to uh, make it easier for folks to join a union um, and to empower more workers that way. Um, and I'll jump in here, first of all, Bharat. You know, I'm duty bound to say that maybe FDR was the most pro labor president in history, but I take your point. We each work for, we each have different bosses at this point. Um, but I want to uh, actually talk a little bit more about the labor market, um, both what we are seeing that is very good, and then just to kind of surface the unspoken uh, question here why isn't more of this good news story that you both are telling and that I am also trying to tell, but why isn't it sticky? I think we should talk about that for a little bit. But first of all, I do wanna just emphasize something that all of you have said, and especially Mike Consul and others at Roosevelt have said, um, you know, real wages for lower income Americans are up. They're up even relative to inf inflation. And this rarely gets reported because we look at averages rather than um, people at the lower end of the income distribution. Um, and that's a very important thing. That's what many of us have been working for for many years. Um, so I think, but, and I think that one of the reasons is that, you know, for a host of 
there's just other things that are um, sort of uh, dominating the media narrative. So you don't really see this very important statistic being um, being reported. But I also, and I also think that federal action rarely gets credit for the fact that wages for lower income Americans are up. And that's what I think we need to dig into a little bit because it's really been puzzling to me. Um, I'm sure that many of the people on this call, many of the reporters on this call have heard uh, you, Barat, and you, Ben, and you know, Brian Deese, and Secretary Yellen, and Heather Boucher, and CeCe Rouse, and many other people make these arguments before about how good the economy is, and yet, you know, public opinion doesn't necessarily reflect that that's breaking through. So why is that? And I have one hypothesis on this, which is that, you know, people attribute, well, first of all, this is like an obvious thing to say, but it's kind of hard to run on a counterfactual. It's kind of hard to run on, well, it, you know, it could have been worse. You should see the other guy. Um, so that's obviously one reason that we people talk about. But the other reason I think is more psychological, which is that I think that people attribute better jobs and higher wages to their own individualized actions, right? I did a good job. I got a raise. Maybe my individual boss, you know, is was generous or something, or, or conversely, not. Um, but I don't think that most people think about a strong labor market enabled by and driven by policy choices. Now, I hope that some of the Amazon strike uh, attention starts to change some of this. Um, but so few Americans are unionized, it's hard to know whether or not that is going to really be sticky, this understanding that workers are in it together. Um, and in contrast, people definitely blame someone else when gas prices go up, when food prices go up. So I think we are facing this, in telling this story, those of you who are trying to tell the story, and I would include myself in that, you know, we're facing this challenge, which is that affordability issues are, or inflation issues or price increase issues are structural, whereas job and wage growth is perceived to be individual. And somehow we've got to figure out how to do a little bit more explaining as to why that isn't so. Yeah, uh, I can make a, I, I have a couple of thoughts on that, uh, Felicia, it's, it's a good question. Um, you know, number one, I think we have to be uh, clear eyed that gas prices play an enormous role in, in uh, the public mood. I think there's, a, there's an extensive body of literature that shows that, uh, and gas prices are really high right now. Now, you know, why, why are gas prices high? Uh, I don't think it's because uh, we overstimulated demand. I think it's because uh, uh, Putin invaded Ukraine, and since uh, he started aggressive actions against Ukraine, prices at the pump are up $1.40 a gallon. Um, and that's significant. That's basically the difference between where we are today and relatively normal gas prices. So um, the president has been clear that uh, he's going to take whatever steps he can to um, address prices at the pump. He's already um, secured and ordered a record uh, release from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve of 180 million uh, barrels, which helped fill some of the supply gap caused by Russia's actions. Um, but uh, but we, we, we are dealing with a geopolitical situation that is uh, disrupting energy markets and causing uh, energy prices to go, uh, get, to get very high. And so I think we have to recognize that that's uh, playing, playing a role here. Uh, you know, the second observation I would make is that you know, re recently the Fed, Federal Reserve put out its survey of household, uh, survey of households. And um, number one, uh, they found that uh, the self-reported you know, uh, financial condition of households was actually higher than it's ever been since the survey started being conducted. So when you ask households, how are you doing financially? The percentage that said we we're doing pretty well uh, was higher than it's ever been since they started doing the survey. Uh, but then if you look at the data on how do you think the uh, national economy is doing, it was uh, a record low. So, you know, how do we, how, how do we think about that uh, enormous gap between how people feel about their own personal situation and how they feel about the national economy. I'm sure other people have theories, but I think it's an interesting divergence that uh, that we need to to examine. Thank you, everyone. Um, follow up question. I want to um, tell everyone that you can submit questions. We're going to go to Q and A in a little bit. Um, please submit questions in the chat box and include your affiliation if you want to. Uh, for our next question, uh, open to everyone. 
Your colleague Brian Deese has talked about the Biden administration's embrace of industrial policy. What are the key features of the Biden administration's industrial policy? Why is this shift important for the economy and how is it contributing to greater resilience in the future economy? And that's uh, open to whoever. So this is, this is a great opportunity for me to talk about one of my favorite topics. My favorite forward phrase is modern supply side economics, which is a speech that Secretary, was birthed in a speech that Secretary Yellen gave to the World Economic Forum. Um, but it was laying out a different approach to supply side economics than, than the one that we've seen uh, that has been championed by conservatives for decades. And, and trying to give that theory sort of a fair hearing for just a moment. I mean, traditional supply side economics says that the combination of sort of widespread deregulation and dramatically lower tax rates on capital will ultimately grow the productive capacity of the economy. Basically, we can make more. Um, if you have really low tax rates on capital. The thing is, is we've tried that and it hasn't worked. And, and in some textbooks that might work, but in the real world, it just doesn't. And we had this really expensive experiment in the form of TCJA and it wasn't successful. And we, it took us a $2 trillion lesson to learn that. Um, but what Secretary Yellen laid out, and I think many of the aspects are uh, reflected in the Biden administration's industrial policy and really fundamental economic policy, is that we want to expand the productive capacity in the United States. We want to make more. Um, but the way to do that is not through ultra low tax rates on capital. It's through expanding the labor market. It's through investment in R&D. It's through uh, targeted investment in communities and businesses and by boosting uh, productivity. So you know, one of the clearest ways to see that is in the Build Back Better proposed legislation that much of that is focused on enabling people to get back to work. That means uh, uh, pre-K investment for universal pre-K. That means um, subsidized childcare. That means tax credits for, for childcare and some versions of Build Back Better. Um, that means capital access for aspiring small business owners. But the idea is, look, we need to push out the supply curve. Um, sorry, we need to push out our productive capacity. Now, part of that in the current crisis has meant addressing supply chain constraints, which uh, simply make it more difficult for American businesses to produce. And all of the people in the administration have been laser focused on that, whether or not we're talking about opening the ports 24 seven on the West Coast, or whether or not we're talking about getting building materials to home builders that can continue to expand the housing supply. But that's been a pretty fundamental theme throughout this administration, and we've all been laser focused on it. And just add quickly to, uh, to Ben's great comments that, um, you know, the president has placed a real priority on making more things in the United States. And there are short-term, medium-term, long-term benefits of that. Uh, if you look at some of the supply chain disruptions that we've had over the last two years, um, I think it, it makes a clear case for uh, the benefit, the resiliency benefit of having uh, more of our supply chains on shore. And that's why, uh, before uh, a lot of these supply chain issues started to emerge in the middle of last year, uh, the president actually issued a supply chain executive order at the beginning of his term to try and bring more of our critical supply chains back onshore and make more things in the United States. That, that, that's not only about creating new good manufacturing jobs in the United States, it's about making sure that, um, uh, that we have a fewer of the disruptions and shortages and other issues that we've seen because of uh, you know, a lockdown in China because of COVID or because of uh, a reduction in ocean carrier capacity or extraordinarily high uh, rates for ocean shipping or whatever the case uh, may be. Um, you know, number two, you know, we, uh, other countries are engaged in industrial policy all the time. And I think it's, uh, our view is that it's, the United States needs to step up to the plate because we are doing our companies and our workers a disservice if we are not doing industrial policy in a thoughtful way. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, you know, that doesn't mean protectionism. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, across the board tariffs or anything like that, but, but we should make investments in, in creating uh, domestic industries that are gonna be the industries of the future. You know, there's a bill pending right now in Congress that has passed the House and the Senate in, in slightly different forms that would make um, a significant investment in domestic semiconductor capacity. 
And the last two years, again, have been a, a stark reminder of what it means when there is a shortage of semiconductors. That, that shortage is, is one of the main reasons why uh, the cost of autos has gone up so much. There's been a, a, an ability to make uh, as many new cars, and that has let, caused the prices to go up. Uh, and that's actually one of, been one of the key drivers of inflation over the last couple of years. So if we have more semiconductor capacity in the United States, that means more jobs in the United States. It means that uh, we're less vulnerable to those kinds of shortages um, going forward. And, and we've been really heartened to see uh, significant new investments in domestic manufacturing over the last year. You have GM making a multi-billion dollar investment in EV manufacturing in Michigan. You have Intel making a $20 billion investment in manufacturing in Ohio. You have Texas Instruments making multi-billion dollar investment in manufacturing uh, in Texas. Uh, you just had the announcement of Samsung and their multi-billion dollar investment in manufacturing in Georgia. So um, under President Biden, it's been a good time to invest in, in American manufacturing. And, and I think that's a critical part of our industrial policy. I'll just add that this is my favorite topic. Uh, and it's my favorite topic for so many reasons, including the fact that it very rarely makes headlines. Um, as you said, Ben and Barat, this really is the policy of the future. And um, I think that this is the kind of policy that requires a government and governance that go far beyond the sort of neoliberal starving government uh, regime that you know, has been for the last 30 years, mostly what has driven the ways in which we thought about managing the economy. I think an acknowledgement by Brian and others, sorry, Brian Deese and others that we can and should be managing certain elements of the economy um, is really, really important. I will just say two other things about this. Um, one is I really thought that, Brian, especially Brian's early speeches on this, focused on equity. That, which I kind of opened up this conversation with, but that is just so important. I think that has to mean at minimum job equity for Americans who've been historically excluded or who live in places where recovery feels really far away. Some of what's in the competition bill actually addresses that regionally. That's critically important. Um, that's important economically. And of course it's important politically. So I really hope that you all continue to push on equity as you develop um, this ind an industrial policy strategy. And I think the other thing that, you know, made a bunch of New York Times columns this weekend around this topic is we do really need to acknowledge um, that stuff needs to get done at the local level in particular if we want to have this kind of supply side approach to building new things in our country. Because at the local level, it's where so many things either get built or don't. Housing is an enormous pain point. You all know it, we all know it. Um, transportation is an enormous pain point. So we need to figure out um, different kinds of federalism that will actually allow things to get done at the local level. And at the same time, build a kind of governance structure such that regular people can have some kind of small D democratic input into what gets built in their towns and in their neighborhoods. And not, um, so getting that balance right is gonna take practice given that we haven't really uh, done this for 30 or more years. Um, we haven't really had an approach to managing our economy that has done that. We have to get back to that um, if we're going to fulfill the promise of the kinds of industrial policy strategies that many of us are hoping for. Thank you, Felicia, and thank you, everyone. Um, we're going to move to Q&A now. Uh, you know, please uh, submit questions uh, in the chat box. Uh, I want to do a, uh, Charlie Cooper uh, in the chat asked a question. I'm going to do a modified version of it, but uh, I was really impressed with uh, Ben's comment about how the view of concentration has changed over the last decade. It reminds me a lot of inequality a decade ago, where the conversation went from inequality among, you know, kind of gatekeeping economists that inequality hadn't increased to it's increased, but, and, you know, it's like taxes and transfers and family size and, and you know, what levels, but, you know, it was a, and those are all really important empirical questions to investigate, but it was acknowledged that inequality had increased quite a bit. And we see the same thing with concentration now, where the conversation has moved from concentration hasn't increased to 
concentration has increased, but you know, there's intangible investments, you know, what is a market even? And that's also very important empirically, but it does mean that we're in a different environment. And uh, the question I have, you know, there's obviously the competition order and a lot of really important innovations, but it, this innovation, which existed pre-COVID, has now bumped up against the unexpectedly high global rate of inflation. And, uh, you know, as uh, a lot of these conversations gotten very heated on social media, which is hard to believe, but I'm curious how you, you both, are, all three of you, think about this relationship between market power concentration and tackling it, both in and of itself and in this period of higher than expected costs, what it can do for families and the economy as a whole. Uh, I can go, I, I'm happy to go first on that one and then, and then uh, eager to see what Ben and Felicia have to say. I think <clears throat> a couple, I think a, a few uh, basic points. Number one, uh, unequivocally, the level of concentration in our uh, economy has increased over the last few decades. Uh, there's a lot of research on this, you know, but according to one study in 75% of, of industries, uh, the market has grown more concentrated over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, so that's point number one. This is not some pandemic era shift where there has been a stark increase in concentration. There's a long-term trend towards uh, greater concentration. Number two, um, more competition uh, has lots of very clear benefits. Number, number one, more competition means lower prices. And it, it's just, it, it's intuitive, right? I, I like to think about the internet the market for internet services, because it's a, an easy one for people to think about. 70 million people live in a place where there's only one internet service provider. And on average, those people pay significantly more per month for internet service than the people who live in places where there's three or more providers. And that's because those companies have to compete for your business. And they, and one of the ways they can do that is by offering you a lower price. Um, so encouraging competition can bring prices down uh, over time. Uh, number two, as Ben has talked about, uh, there's labor market competition too. And one of the benefits uh, of increasing uh, competition is that you have more companies competing for workers, which means that they have to offer higher wages in order to attract workers uh, uh, to, to that employer. And that's a good thing from our perspective. Um, number three, there, as you said, Mike, there's been a lot of heated debate about uh, what is the exact role of uh, concentration in uh, the current inflation that we're seeing. What we at, at the National Economic Council have focused on is that there is evidence to our, in, in our view, that in highly concentrated markets, uh, uh, in response to a, a supply shock or a demand shock, there's evidence that, that, that companies in those highly concentrated markets are raising prices higher than they, than they would in, in more competitive markets. You know, we've seen that in, in meat processing, where there's four companies, for example, that control 80% of the market for beef. Um, and we're concerned about that in, in ocean shipping, where there's three global alliances that essentially control all of east-west trade uh, between Asia and the United States. And where prices have gone up a thousand percent, you know, that's 10 times uh, since, since the pandemic began. Uh, you know, do, do, do underlying supply and demand play a role in all of that? Of course. And we don't want to diminish that. But the point is, what happens when there is a supply or demand shift in these types of concentrated markets? I think it's a really... Um, interesting and challenging empirical question, and people have done some good work on it. Uh, but you know, our view is it's it's in a world where we are trying to do everything that we can to tackle inflation. It would be silly, from my perspective, not to push for more competition, because if it has a positive effect on inflation, that's good. But we know that even apart from inflation, it's going to have other positive impacts. So let's do what we can. Let's push for more competition. Uh, and let's hope that that will have a, a good effect on inflation. But, but even if it doesn't, it's going to have other uh, salutary effects over time. So that's, that's my perspective. That was, that was so good. I mean, I, 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 I want to say something other than just agreeing with Bharat on this. But let me just say that, you know, I don't know precisely what role competition has in recent inflation trends. And to a certain extent, you know, we are just more focused on solutions rather than empirical academic exercises. Like when I leave the Biden administration, I go back to Northwestern, wherever I go, I'll spend time decomposing price trends. That's fine. Right now, we're just trying to improve the situation for American families, which is why you've seen so many different initiatives come out of the Biden administration on this point. A second point to make is, you know, I think one of the lessons from the product market that we learned from our review of uh, labor markets is that even in some circumstances where there isn't concentration in labor markets, you can still have anti-competition. So even in places where there's a lot of employers, 
um, it doesn't look like a competitive labor market and more approximates the monopsony or, um, or you know, imperfect competition. And that's because of some of the policies around labor markets. Now, these, the policies that can inhibit competition are really different in product versus labor markets. But you can even see lack of competition even in areas where there isn't um, concentration. A third is, you know, broad, broad brought up broadband. And I kind of feel like, why are we on our heels defending a product market where there's one supplier and defending that as competitive? I mean, any economist would tell you if there's just one supplier for a good, that, that, is, the, that is a definition of monopoly, right? So like, why are we out here pretending like every product market is competitive? That's clearly not the case. And I think eventually maybe we'll get to the point with product markets where we've got to with labor markets, where we can acknowledge that in many markets, there's severe lack of competition. Um, and acknowledging that other markets, they, they are competitive. And, and, and what we've done is we've drilled down on those markets where we see lack of competition. Um, and these sort of sweeping macroeconomic statements are not helpful because you have to deal with these problems one at a time. Um, the last thing I'll say, and this really isn't related to your question, but I just want to talk about it a little bit, is one thing we've seen is it's not, it, you know, there's a supply demand mismatch right now, and that drives inflation. A supply demand mismatch has two parts. It has supply and demand. We've been talking a lot about demand and we've talked a lot about supply chains, but another part of the driver of inflation has been decisions that companies made very reasonably, in, in, in my opinion. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a CEO, but I don't, I'm not critiquing the companies for decisions that are made, but to, but to cut down on capacity during the pandemic. And we talked about the fantastic uncertainty we saw in 2020 and 2021, and a few examples uh, that we've highlighted on social media coming out of the Treasury Department have been A, so for example, we've seen the rental fleet cut by one third between 2020 and mid 2021. Now, if I sat you down in Econ 101 and said, predict what's gonna happen to rental car prices, if you see a one third shift in capacity and demand remain the same, your answer has gotta be prices go up. For refining capacity, we're seeing higher prices at the pump, which is brought noted is very much related to Putin's war in Ukraine. But during the pandemic, we also saw refining capacity in the United States shift inward by 800,000 barrels a day. Demand is roughly the same as it was before the pandemic. It's even down by a little bit, but capacity has been shifted inward. So what happens? So I guess the point is that, you know, competition is a big part of it, but also an inward shift in capacity in certain markets has also been on um, a driver of, of inflation in certain product markets. Excellent. Um, give me one second. Uh, we have one, another question. Sorry, I apologize. Um, from Chris uh, Rigaber, uh, reporter at the Associated Press. Um, before this current spat of inflation, there appeared to be increasing support by, uh, among economists for running the labor market hot in order to boost worker power and increase wages. How much has that now been undercut because of higher prices and will there be political support for hot labor markets going forward? And I also just wanna broaden the um, question a bit more. You know, obviously we're in the middle of this recovery and President Biden has talked about the, you know, switching gears into the next stage of this recovery. What are some lessons you are learning about uh, how to manage a recovery that you think are, are useful or surprising to you or, or relevant for this question? So I, I can go with a kind of quick answer here, which is that, um, you know, I think that in part because the last recovery was so long and prolonged, we got into a period where more jobs was better, more stimulus was better. It was more, more, more. Um, and here we, we made up that gap much faster. And so when you, see, you saw this in the president's op-ed earlier this week where we, we made up so many jobs and we've closed the output gap, which by the way, the output gap in the United States is much, much less than it is any other developed economy. Um, and so now we're sort of shifting this period of managed, balanced growth, uh, which means you're balancing, obviously, uh, worker power negotiation with helping businesses find the workers they need. Um, we're certainly, uh, as a growth strategy, looking to expand productive capacity. Uh, you know, you're not seeing calls for stimulus. And so one of the lessons I've learned is that this recovery is not like the past one. We're not in a situation where we need a million new jobs a month to get to where we wanna be. Uh, what we need is managed, balanced, sustainable, equitable growth. 
And, um, and I think that shift is a, is a pretty important one. Yeah, I, I just want to add, look, we're for higher wages. We think higher wages are good. And, uh, and I think that the, the idea that uh, the current inflation that we have is driven in large part by higher wages, I don't think that there's a lot of evidence for that. I mean, is the price of gas up $1.40 per gallon since Putin's invasion of Ukraine because wages went up in the oil and gas sector? I don't think that that's correct. Uh, are the prices of cars up tremendously over the last two years because wages went up for auto workers? Or is it because there was a huge, as Ben talked about, uh, reduction in capacity and that there was a semiconductor shortage? So, you know, from our perspective, uh, we're, we're for higher wages. I think that um, the benefits of running a higher, of a, running a tighter uh, labor market are uh, enormous. They are uh, good for people up and down the income spectrum. It's an enormously important for having a more equitable uh, economy. Uh, a tighter labor market has all sorts of uh, product, uh, good, good, good benefits on productivity. You know, as as uh, as companies uh, need to get more out of the workers that they have, they invest more in training. They invest more in uh, and smart uh, technological innovation, which is good for the long-term uh, productivity of our economy. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's very important uh, for us as an administration to reaffirm our commitment to, uh, you know, strong labor markets and the benefits that they cause. And I think it's very important for us to, to note that the key drivers of inflation that we are dealing with right now um, it's hard to attribute that to any sort of, uh, you know, wage, wage push inflation. I'll just add, first of all, Mike, you should really answer this question, but, uh, you know, we are also all for hot labor markets here at the Roosevelt Institute. We've done a lot of work on that, um, led by Mike uh, and others on our macroeconomics team. But I'll just say that, you know, a lot of the way I see this reported is not about the benefits of a hot labor market, but instead about this idea, uh, some notion of a labor shortage. And the reason I think you see it reported in that way is actually about material conflict class conflict, as it were, not to sound like an academic uh, with respect to by, by uh, invoking class conflict. But honestly, you know, I think a lot of people say like, why is it harder for me to get service at a restaurant? Oh, that must be um, because of a labor shortage rather than the perspective that workers have um, they have more power and more ability to get better jobs and the market has to catch up to that. So I would just say that, yes, we want a hotter labor market. We are definitely for higher wages and where there's a material conflict that's gonna come out of that, um, that is a reflection of moving to a more equitable economy, which is what we want. Thank you. Um, we're getting a lot of questions about uh, oil and gas, as you can imagine. Um, this one is from Skanda, our friend at Employ America. Beyond gas, the fallout from the Russian invasion is clearly proven to be much broader. For an example, putting price pressure on our key agricultural and metallic inputs. What is the administration doing to better map out these linkages and to offset the losses affecting global markets? And more broadly, how should these types of networked impacts affect how we think about trade policy and the government's capacity to ensure stable supply across inputs that are critical, but often volatile in price and rank in the value chain. Uh, ben, you want to go? I, I'm, I'm happy to go. No, <laughs> okay. uh, no these, are good, these are good questions. And I, I, know I, can, I can attest to the fact that there's a ton of work happening within the White House and across the administration on uh, managing the fallout, uh, not just on oil and gas, but on other commodities uh, because of uh, Putin's actions in Ukraine. Um, as, as Skanda noted in his question, there's um, huge impacts on, on wheat, on, on other uh, food products, uh, and on minerals. Um, it, it's, it's an area of continuing work, and I don't want to say too much about it because there's a lot of um, uh, stuff still happening behind closed doors on it, but it is a, it is a key area of focus of ours, and, and in particular on some of the food related shortages that may not necessarily show up most saliently in the United States, but may really affect um, uh, other countries. You know, we're trying to be proactive about that and lead a global effort to make sure that there is not um, really bad fallout on the food side, uh, uh, if at all possible. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, we, 
this this has this pandemic has driven home just how dependent the U.S. is in certain areas on uh, foreign countries, and and yeah, I think that has insights uh, that that has some cert, should teach us certain things on the trade side, um, but I think it, it you know it also underscores uh, why it's so important to develop uh, domestic industries to the extent um, that we can so that we are uh, less vulnerable. And I would just say, you know, particularly the case on, on oil and gas, right? Of course, in the short term, it is incumbent upon us to fill the, uh, the, the, the gap in oil and gas production that's caused by Russia's actions. But it really uh, should reaffirm for everybody uh, the need, as the president has been talking about, to shift away from fossil fuels so that we are no longer uh, subject to the whims of people like Putin. Um, and so that it's not only good for the environment, it's also good for the, the safety and security of the United States. It's also good for family pocketbooks so that they're not spending $20 more each time they fill up their, their car uh, if you can get a, a good, reliable, cheap electric vehicle or that their, heating, uh, their home heating costs or cooling costs don't shoot up because of the actions of a dictator you know, halfway across the world. Um, you know, that it's just yet another good reason for us uh, to move forward on the climate package that the president has proposed. Yeah, if you if you go back and look at some of the campaign documents right around the time the pandemic was was um, unfortunately getting started, you'll see how important it was for the president to do exactly what Barat's talking about, which is that some things we just have to make on U.S. soil. You know, medical equipment. Uh, uh, medicines, things that are critical to national security. Just you just have to have that for national security on U.S. soil. Some things are just better made here, also. I mean, the president is an unabashed supporter of American manufacturing, um, and energy is just in clear focus right now. Uh, you know, one thing that we've we've sort of discussed at the Treasury Department, obviously, has been a broader theme. The president gave a a speech on this a couple of months ago has been the unique opportunity right now to shift the way that we produce and consume energy and particularly produce energy. This is such a unique opportunity. We've known for a long time we've had to address the way we produce energy for climate change. We've known for a long time that that shifting to more renewable sources uh, is more reliable in many ways. Um, but it's also good geopolitical strategy. Russia does not control the sun. And so as a long-term strategy, I think it, we're in a unique moment right now where we can solve a lot of problems by changing the way we, we produce energy. And um, it's, it's just been a major effort from the Biden administration. Um, that's all. Yeah, my colleagues, um, Lauren Melody and Chris Carlson just wrote a fantastic report on this as part of our All Economic Policy is Climate Policy series, where they really um, addressed the multiple reasons that moving to um, clean electricity in particular would be better for price stability as well as for the planet. So um, I encourage everybody to check that out. Um, the other thing I'll say about um, about this question of domestic production and supply chains. You know, I was part of, I was the US representative to the G7 expert panel on these issues. And we had a big debate about this actually. Uh, and I think that this administration is in the place where we would, where it would say, you all can tell me, but where, where, uh, where, where you all would basically say that some things do need to be built domestically. And it is also very important to look at a kind of plurilateral strategy or an alliance of democracies um, for uh, building supply chains for some of these kinds of goods. So, um, I think there's an, there's an interesting debate between how much of this should be purely domestic and how much of this um, can and should be part of a different approach to um, trade as you all have laid out in the um, Indo-Pacific uh, set of uh, framework, so. With one minute left, a quick quick round question uh, from Trevor Hunnicutt from uh, Reuters. Any thoughts on proposals such as those from Senator Whitehouse and Representative Khanna to tax oil and gas profit windfalls to provide direct payments to people struggling with higher energy costs? United Kingdom just announced a similar plan. Um, I, 
you know, I think that we we are very much open to any proposal that would um, pro provide relief to consumers uh, at the pump and, and help defray some of those costs. I think there are a variety of, of interesting proposals and design choices on uh, a windfall profits tax. Um, we've looked carefully at, at each of them uh, and are engaging in conversations with Congress about uh, about design, you know, one thing you you want to be aware of when you are looking at those types of proposals is how is it going to affect uh, supply uh, as well. Um, it, I don't think that that's an insurmountable hurdle, but it is an important question at a time when there's clearly a supply issue uh, as well. So uh, uh, we, we we really welcome those proposals from Congress, and I think there's been a lot of good thinking done uh, among a lot of different groups in Congress on that. Well, uh, right on time. I feel proud of ourselves. Uh, thank you so much. This is incredibly informative. Uh, I learned a lot. I hope everyone who stayed uh, learned a lot. I'd like to thank everyone for joining. I'd like to thank Bharat, Ben, and Felicia for uh, joining us today to talk about the future of the economy.